Antwerps, welcome to Let's Build Computers. It's time for a good old fashioned build video. You know, like it, like the title of this series, Let's Build Computers is supposed to be. However, I haven't actually done one for a while. And this is gonna be a super tasty one as well. This is probably gonna be the fastest computer I've built in this shop. Um, just purely because we've got a Ryzen 3900X here and we've got a, a RTX 2080 Super over here going into it. And just purely by the fact that this is the newest stuff, uh, it's, yeah, going to be the nicest gaming computer I've built in here. The cost for the build we're doing today is 1950 so just under the £2,000 mark. That's Great British Pounds. Um, and uh, most of the items I've picked, we've done a really good balance, I think. Now, when you're going in with a Ryzen 9 and a 2080, some people start going into the realms of sort of money, no objects and stuff like that. Um, however, I have toned down a couple of the components here and there. I'll explain that as I go along as to why I picked those components. But a lot of it was mainly driven by the fact that I wanted to keep the cost of this build under the £2,000 marker. And also keep in mind that I am also in business to make money. So when I say that the build needs to cost less than £2,000, that also needs to include me actually earning a living wage from this as well. So let's get into the build. So the CPU I've picked is the Ryzen 9 3900X. Um, and this is mainly for pimp value. Um, so obviously the two notable models are you've got the 3950X above this one. However, because this is a gaming PC, there is zero point whatsoever in going up to the 3950X because there are no games that will actually benefit from that. Uh, if anything, we may even lose some performance because of clock speeds and boosting and stuff like that. Um, there's a strong argument to be made that you're better off going with a 3800X for exactly this reason. However, the customer wanted the Ryzen 9 just so they had that Ryzen 9 number on the computer. So this is fine. Um, and in addition to that, the price of this is not too obnoxious. As soon as you go up to the 3950X, you double the price again. Well, nearly double the price again. Whereas this guy offers the general, the most performance before the price curve really starts jumping. So again, for the budget that we're working within, the Ryzen 9 will offer generally the biggest numbers we can get on our budget. The motherboard I've chosen is the MSI MPGX 570 Gaming Plus. Uh, and this was mainly a price driven choice. With motherboards, I generally look for something between 100 and 200, um, as in pound sterling or US dollars. The prices are about the same because of reasons. Um, and I'll usually look for this one because we were putting in the 3900X, I started looking at closer toward the 200 marker. However, I was looking at the 200 and I was looking for something that seemed to be well priced and have about the same kind of features in. And there seems to be around a, a plateau as you approach the 200 marker where a lot of the boards, the prices are sort of starting to creep up, but they don't seem to have much measurable use, useful features in the more expensive ones until you go up to the next category where you start getting into the realms of um, a higher class VRM, having Wi-Fi, having more RGB and so on and so forth. I didn't want to go up into that league because that was going to add another 50 or so onto the price just straight away. Uh, whereas with this guy, this came in at a reasonable price and has a very good feature set and it's got an adequate VRM for the CPU that we're using. The RAM is a set of Corsair Vengeance RGB Pro and I've got it at 3600 megahertz. It's no secret that AMD Ryzen loves RAM speed. So I wanted to go for at least sort of um, either 3400 or 3600 at a minimum. Um, and the, uh, the Vengeance stuff doesn't appear to come at 3400 speed. It looks like it goes from 32 to 3600. So I opted for the 3600. We're paying a little bit extra for the RAM speed and the LEDs on this. However, 
um, for the client, I wanted to have some RGB in this system. And obviously with the 3600, I think I thought it was worth spending the extra 20 pounds or so to just bump up to that speed. And this means that I don't have to do any real overclocking on this memory to get the most out of our CPU. Whereas if I'd opted for the 32 or, th you know, if I'd opted for 3000 or 3200, then there would probably be a lot of people saying, mm, you probably should have gone a little bit higher than that just to get that last bit. So I paid a little bit extra and this is the last memory this computer is going to need unless later on down the line they want to drop in another 16 gigabyte kit. But for the vast majority of gaming systems, 16 gigs is absolutely fine. Onto the graphics card and we've got an MSI RTX 28 Super Gaming X Trio. Uh, now it's been a while since I've looked at high-end graphics cards. Um, this is my first encounter with a 2080 in fact. Um, I usually don't shop at this kind of area. The 2080 Super, as far as I could tell, seems to be the best bang for buck at the high end. You know, obviously the only thing higher up than this guy is the 2080 Ti. However, that will net you another 500 on top of this. This guy already costs 750 pounds. Um, however, the 2080 Ti, all the ones I could see about that were all up at the sort of 1200 to 1300 marker. And absolutely, the Ti is faster than the Super. However, the Super is already a stonking quick graphics card, but I really don't think it's worth paying another 500 on top for the Ti, unless you actually need every single last drop, or you've got the money to spend on your, you know, on your wallet, be it. Um, the reason for opting was the for the MSI was it was well priced. We've got a big triple fan cooler on this. I'm going to start opening it up. Big triple fan cooler, so we know it's going to run nice and cool and nice and quiet. And because we're using an MSI motherboard as well, I wanted to try and brand match a little bit. Um, brand matching obviously has no impact on the performance of your computer. However, if you're doing a nice expensive build, it's nice to brand match when you can. I've actually had criticism on other builds before. I had someone criticize my personal computer at home where they said, oh, you've used too many brands. You shouldn't use that many brands. I'm like, it's just a brand name, dude. It doesn't matter. However, it is nice to brand match when you can. Whew, this guy's a behemoth. Let's take a look. And this is why I didn't use the Corsair 220T. That guy is enormous. That's a big beefy boy. So big three, three fan design, lots and lots of heat sinking there. Dual eight pin connectors. Uh, and is that back plate functional? It is, I can see thermal pads. Not many, but there is some thermal pads going on there-ish. So they are actually passing some heat into this metal back plate, which is always nice to see as well. God, this, this guy is huge. I think that is the biggest graphics card I've seen to date. Um, and obviously we've got RGB illumination on these areas here. So that'll look really nice in the case. You'll know it's there. This is going to be one of the centerpieces of the, well, the centerpiece of this computer, I would say. Very, very nice. Let's get it in there. And for posterity, it's come with an anti-sag bracket as well. I've never seen that before. I wonder whether we'll need that but or not. In the cooling department, we've got an IQ H100i RGB Pro XT. So it's a H100i, basically. There's been a lot of these. The H100i has been around for a long time. I've used many of them. Uh, and to date, I've only had a single failure. Um, and that has been a minor failure, not a catastrophic failure. Um, so as I say, the H100i has a good track record with me. Um, and it's reasonably priced. This guy has crept up in price over time. Used to be sitting around the £100 marker. These days, I think this was closer to 120 However, it's still good bang for buck, and this is easily going to manage a 3900X. So there are obviously the bigger variations of this. You've got the H115 that has the 280mm radiator rather than the 240 on this. However, I actually prefer 240mm radiator because it doesn't make an enormous difference to the actual cooling ability of the device. However, the 240mm gives you much more flexibility with where you can mount it, specifically when you're top mounting. Um, so 
We've got the usual Corsair fans in there. Big, heavy PWM fans. They're very nice. No RGB on those, which is a pity for this build. But again, if I wanted to go full RGB, then I basically would have needed to slap another 100 to 200 pounds onto the price tag. So I had to draw the line somewhere. Something that I really like about the evolution of the H100i is just simply the hoses on them. Um, these have gotten really nice over time. They started out as just sort of being a bit sort of rubber garden hose. Then they went through a phase of making the hoses very thick and heavyweight, which made it very difficult to mount the cooler and route the hosing in an aesthetically pleasing way. Whereas now we've got a nice decent sized hose, which is really nice and flexible, so you can do a lot with it, and it just looks really good. I'm eager to see how good the RGB is on this as well. Um, they've got a, a, a dressable ring around the outside and the center logo. They haven't done anything super exotic like NZXT have. Um, however, by keeping it relatively simple, that has kept the cost down on it as well. Whereas the NZXT um, Kraken coolers, as lovely as they are, they're horrifyingly expensive. So that drives the cost toward Corsair as far as I'm concerned. For the power supply, we've got a Corsair RM750. Um, this was driven by two factors. I wanted something that was somewhere between 600 and 800 watts to make sure that we had ample power for the system with a bit of overheads for just in case because that 2080 Super will be pretty thirsty with its dual 8-pin connectors. The 3900X probably doesn't use as much power as most people would think it would. However, we just want to make sure that we're covering all the bases. And we also want to make sure that we have a good selection of connectors as well, especially for the aforementioned dual 8-pin connectors. Uh, cheaper power supplies, you might get caught out by not having enough connectors for the power supply. Then the other driving factor as well was availability. As of the time of making this video, power supply, the power supply market is a freaking mess right now. There's been shortages. Instead of having the huge selection that you normally see, at a range of very agreeable prices, we had just only a couple in stock up in the mid or high end stuff. And a lot of them just going for, quite frankly, silly money for what you're getting. Whereas this was, uh, I think I paid £130 for this. And uh, really, I would, exp I would be wanting to pay, I would want to be paying about closer to £100 for this power supply. But it is what it is. This is how much these things are going for right now. But we have got full modular. And of course, when we check our rails on the back, um, we've got a 12 volt rail with a massive 62 and a half amps on it. So it's doing 750 watts just on its 12 volt rail, which is a good indicator that it's going to be a great power supply. And being, a, uh, being the Corsair RM series, these are really quite in operation and they're gold rated as well, which means you've got a modest heat output with a nice quiet fan on it. And I think this fan has got auto shut off as well. I'm not sure if just the RMX series has that or whether the RM non-X can do it too. I'm hoping it can, but if not, Corsair power supplies on the whole, I find them to be very quiet. So I've got no beef if it doesn't have auto shut off on the fan. Our cable selection for this power supply is very broad. They're just the standard Corsair ribbon style connectors. We don't have any real fancy braiding except for the ATX lead down here. Um, so something that might be nice to add into this computer later on are individually braided cables. However, this again is just another add-on cost. By the time we've got those cables, that's going to be another 40 quid onto the bill. It all adds up. However, stuff like this is very easy to change in retrospect. So you know, we don't need to worry about this stuff too much. These are nice little add-ons that even the customer could add on to the computer late at a later date if they wanted to. The SSD that I'm putting in is a Sabrent Rocket Q. This is an NVMe SSD that goes into an M.2 slot. Ah. And I've bought it in the one terabyte flavor. Um, this computer is going to be used just for gaming and there's not a huge amount of games that are going to be put on this. So one terabyte is absolutely fine. Am I going to have to destroy this box? And in terms of price point, there are three SSDs that I look for when I'm specking up a computer. As of the time of recording this, um, I look for the Sabrent Rocket, the uh, Crucial P1, or the Intel 660P. They all come in one terabyte flavors. And all of them, generally speaking, they all punch around the, the 100 pound marker. So I will generally select 
whichever one comes in at the cheapest price at the time of purchase. And in this instance, at the time of buying, the Sabrent was the cheapest that I could currently get hold of. And as I say, sometimes it'll be the Intel 660p, sometimes it'll be the Crucial P1. I'll get with, they're all good NVMe SSDs. I'll get whichever one is closest to hundred pounds. I really like this little case that these come in, but the only problem is, is that once you put it on your motherboard, what do you do with the case? It's lovely presentation, but also kind of useless. Hmm. Let's get started. So I'm going to start with the motherboard. We've got a little bit of building up to do with this. Not a huge amount because where we're going to water cool this thing, um, the, the water cooler needs to be fitted once everything is in situ anyway. So yeah, um, I'm going to start just by sticking the CPU, RAM and the SSD in this guy. And then that's just one less thing we've got to do. So for the RAM, we're going to put those... Ah, oh, I don't have dual latching. Oh, MSI, come on. I really hate boards that don't have dual latching uh, uh, dim slots on them because it means I have to do this weird thing where you put one end in and then you put the other end in and it just doesn't feel as nice. I will always make a point of that and I will always be salty about it when I see single latch dim slots. I don't like them. It just invites problems. There we go reasonably tall memory for with this so watch out if you're using in a board where you might have head height issues in goes our 3900x cpu give it the usual wiggle to make sure it's seated nicely And our SSD requires this screw down to be relocated. Oh, that was only finger tight, thankfully. So I'll move that back to there. Slot you in. And now to secure that, the motherboard did actually come with a uh, cooling plate. These cooling plates are not really critical, but it doesn't hurt to stick them on there. Um, the To be technical about it, huh, do I need to put... How does that work? So this has come with extra standoffs, which go where? So one of them goes through one of the actual main screw holes so when you screw your motherboard into the computer, you need to put this special standoff in as your, as your motherboard screw it, and that provides an extra screw hole for that end. And then the other one goes down there. Right, so I can't actually put this in right now. I have to wait until the motherboard is in the case. So let's put all this to one side and we'll do that in a moment. I'm not an enormous fan of that. Um, that's a really nap implementation as far as I'm concerned. It will all work once it's in the computer, but that's a absolute pain in the backside at the build level. I should just be able to put that SSD in whenever I want. Uh, fine. Well, in that case, we're done building up the board. So let's bring the case in and we can start building up the case. Let's start by putting the power supply in. So. On this case, we have 230 millimeter gap from the back of the case to the hard drive cage. Realistically, modular cables are going to take up another 50 millimeters at the back uh, behind the power supply. So, so realistically, you're going to start having problems with power supplies that are. 280, 290 millimeters long. Um, if your power supply, ah. So realistically, you're gonna start having problems with any power supply that is longer than 180 millimeters. Um, you might be able, you'll be able to squeeze it in. However, if you're using a big power supply that is longer than 180 millimeters, you may have to remove the drive cage. You're go it's going to be up to how much you want to cram your cables in, but if you want any kind of cable dump space as well as the drive cage, really 180 millimeters long is the hard limit on your power supply. 
This RM6750 fits no problem whatsoever though. So it is prudent to plan out what cables you're going to use in advance. So I've already got my 24 pin ATX connected. We also need our 8 pin CPU or EPS connector. So I'll just pick that out from the selector armor. There's one. Did this power supply come with two? It did, that's nice. The power supply came with two CPU headers, so you can do dual 8-pin off of this thing, uh, if you're a mad lad. Um, it's not necessary unless you're doing um, extreme overclocking. However, it's there if you want it. So uh, let's see, let's plug that guy in there. Actually, how much length have we got on these things? Yeah, we're fine. I'm gonna put that in there because of reasons. And there's our split 4 plus 4 connector that's going to go up to our CPU. Then I'm going to need two 8-pin VGAs or two 8-pin PCI Expresses. And this power supply came with three of them. So uh, this power supply came with enough cables for a triple connector card, but it didn't come with enough if you want to start using um, SLI and stuff like that. But at that point, you could start looking into custom cables. Now, we have no SATA devices going into this computer because we've got just the M.2 SSD that we're fitting. However, I'm going to plug in a single SATA chain here anyway, just so if later on down the line the customer wants to put a hard drive in there or some kind of peripheral that needs SATA power, there's a cable that's just sitting in there waiting to be used. It doesn't cost anything to do this, and if it sits there unused, then it sits there unused. I'll give them all of the spare cables anyway, but it just means that there's just something there for them to use. Right, and now before I actually put all of this in place, I'm gonna remove the hard drive cage just to make all of the cable routing easier. I will be putting this back in by the end of the build because we have got room to put it back in there, so that way it's just stored with the case. However, I'm taking it out just to give myself room to move right now. And this is removed by taking out this screw up here and four screws at the bottom of the case. And apparently... Ugh. And cannot... Oh no! You have to slide it all the way along to get it out of the case. Do you have to remove the power supply to get that in or out? Oh, that's terrible. Oh, that's a nuisance for building. Ugh. Could I bend that in? Not without some real, not without some real GBH. That's te oh no, fine, okay. I mean, as a backup, I can move it all the way up to here. I can't screw it in while it's in this position, but at least I can move it out of my immediate way while I put in my power supply. And I know full well that I'm gonna get hate in the comments for this, so yes, I mount my power supply upside down with the fan pointing up. I have reasons for that. I made a video about it. The long and the short of it is that if your power supply is mounted fan side up and your power supply enclosure is vented to allow you to do so, then it just means that you don't need to worry about ever doing maintenance on the bottom vent of the case, which is very good when you're building a computer for someone else and you don't know if they're going to actually do maintenance on it or not. So that's why I mount them upside down. Um, and it also, the other thing as well is that your power supply really doesn't care about getting air from inside the case. It really doesn't care. There we go. And now I'm gonna start planning my cable tidying from the very beginning for this. So firstly, where's my CPU power? There's my CPU power. So this guy, I'm gonna route this over the top of all the other cables. That's immediately gonna come up here and I'm just gonna plumb this straight up the side of the case all the way up to the top corner here, poke him through there, and tuck him out the way. Later on, I'll cable tie this guy down in place so he doesn't flap around. 
However, just straight away, that guy's just gone out of the way. It's out of the way of all the other cables. We don't care about this guy anymore. He's done. And that is going to go through the top one. And again, <clears throat> we'll tie this down later, but I can't tie it down right now because I don't know quite how much slack I need. My plan will be to tie that down just tight along the back here and then just have the slack sit around the bottom. We should have just enough space for that. Then my SATA chain that I don't need, I'm going to bring that around the front of everything. And that guy is going to go and just sit in the hard drive cage. And I'm going to stick a couple of these wire ties that I pulled off of these around this just to stop it from rattling around too much. And that's just going to sit in the drive cage and do absolutely nothing because it will probably never ever get used, but it's there in case someone needs it. And then finally, my two big VGA um, ones. So theoretically, because these are, um, um, because these are uh, daisy chain ones, we could run a single one of these. There's a lot of argument about people saying sort of, oh, you shouldn't do that and stuff like that. Um, it depends on the graphics card. Um, if it were, generally speaking, it's okay because like this cable and these connectors more than capable of carrying 400 watts. You know, you're going to get, you know, 360 to 400 watts down this cable, no problem at all. And if you're running your graphics card at stock speeds and you're not doing anything particularly st stupid with it, that's going to have no problems whatsoever. Your graphics card isn't going to use three or 400 watts uh, under normal conditions. However, um, if you've got the cables on hand to link up two of them, so then you're splitting the load between two cables, um, then absolutely go for it. And that's what I'm going to do here. I've got the cables on hand, so I will do that. Um, there have been videos in the past where I have not done that, but that was also fueled purely by the fact that I didn't have the spare cables on hand for it. So we went with a single cable because that was what was appropriate for the time. Um, however, here I've got two cables, so I'm going to use them. Um, I am going to... Uh, I will probably tie these back there and hide them, um, but I'm not going to do that quite yet. Um, I'm just going to make sure that these are poking up through the grommet, though, so they're on hand. Actually, no, I'm going to do that later. For now, I'm just going to tuck these back out of the way because I'm not quite sure how these are going to sit yet, because they're not going to come out the back. They're going to go up through the power supply shroud. In the meantime, they're just going to have to sit at the back here and get in the way of everything. I'll just sit them back there so they can lay flat and I can turn the computer over. Right, and with that in, in mind, I'm now going to push this hard drive caddy back into place. I'm not going to put all the screws back into that though because I'm foreseeing that I'm going to have to move that again to route my VGA cables, sorry, my PCI Express cables later on in the build. So I'm going to leave that as is. Uh, the last item of business I've got to sort out is I'm going to reroute all these front panel cables. I'm going to pull all of these back because we need to reorganize all of this. I'm going to do something a little bit different with the front panel audio cable. I'm going to go along the top and down the back, just simply because it gets it out of the way of this area, which is generally the most congested. And that means this guy's going to go down to the bottom right here, and then it's just going to poke up into the corner, which is where it's going to plug into the motherboard. And then he can all get cable tied down with the CPU power line later on. My USB 3 is going to come out around here-ish, so I'll just push him through that grommet there, and then he'll get tied down the back. Then my front panel wires, these are pretty thin on the ground because um, Corsair have just abandoned the hard drive activity LED, which I disagree with. I, I like having a hard drive activity LED. I think it's still useful, but Corsair apparently don't think that's useful. So we've just got power reset and power LED. And these guys are going to come up. Ugh. 
we don't have any holes to put those through. They've got to come up in the top right. Oh, I don't. The, they've got to come out at the bottom right here. Oh, I'm not a fan of that. That means they've got to go across like that. Uh, or I take them through this grommet, which I don't really want to do. Um, I have got an idea for that, though, and that would be neater from a cable tidying perspective. So I'll bring those through with the USB 3. I may change my mind on that in a minute. We'll come back to that. And we've done our rough plumbing. So let's flip this over and get the board in place. Rear IO shield, put that in now before you forget. And just a little quick tip, I just bend these tabs up a little bit, which just makes it a little bit easier to fit the motherboard. And we'll just pl plop that guy in the back. Start in the corners, try and get all your corners in, and then you just sort of go round and round until it's fully in on all sides. That one actually went in without too much of a fight. Sweet. Time for motherboard. And I'm just going to lower this guy in. And just line that up on the rear I.O. panel. And just give that, whoop, there it goes, a gentle nudge. And that has just located on the notch that sticks up out of this standoff here uh, on this uh, Corsair case. Corsair cases, the center standoff just has a little notch that sticks up slightly and just helps you get that guy centered. It's very handy. And I'm just going to check that all our other um, standoffs are in place. It feels like something is trapped underneath the motherboard. Oh, it's just where I've got I've got cables underneath the back panel that's just bowing the back of the case slightly. That's okay. That'll all get sorted in a moment when everything is plumbed in. Right, and I can see now that my front panel noodly wires, these were best off coming out of here. So I'm going to reroute those and just bring them out next to the, well, behind the PCI Express power lines. So that's fine. That's not ideal. Really, this case could do with some more holes along the back here. They should have put this guy further up front and another slot at the back for front panel wires, in my opinion. But it's fine. I can work with this. Right, I'm going to screw in the motherboard. And if you recall, I've got to use this weird standoff boy on this guy so I can put my M.2 cooler in place. Oh, okay. That's very smart of them. That's why there was two of them. There's a metric and an imperial one. So we've got one guy with the um, th six, the 32.6 um, thread on it and one with the M3 metric thread on it. So whichever style standoffs you've got, metric or imperial, they'll have the correct standoff in there for you. I wonder why that wasn't screwing in then. However, I'm having trouble getting that guy to screw in. I'm going to come back to that in just a moment. What I want to do is get all the big heavy cables connected up um, and strapped to the back of the case. So then we don't have a lot of stuff floating. Because we've got these cables flapping around, the, the case isn't resting very well. And I don't really want to put my elbow into anything right now. So I'm going to get everything actually plumbed in. And then we'll take a closer look at that and see if that's going to be an issue or not. Don't forget to check that the locking levers are closed on the ATX and 8-pin connectors when you put them in. If you can't feel that locking connector rocking on the connector block, once you've pushed it in, it's not in properly. If it's sitting there like that, it's not in. If it's sitting there like that, that's fine. There we go. This standoff is going in now. Um, I've got my hand on the back side of the motherboard so I can support it while I press into the screw. So that means I can just screw this in carefully without feeling like I'm bending the motherboard while I'm pressing onto the screw. Yeah, that guy's in just fine. It was just the thread locker. Let's do a little bit of housekeeping now. We've got the main wires plumbed in. So firstly, I want to strap down the ATX cable so this guy isn't trying to press out anywhere. So I'm going to start grabbing the 
zip ties that came with the case and the power supply. Sometimes you get to points like this where you're just like, I want this cable to be under this one. So it's like, fine, just unplug it. You can always plug them back in again. So I'm just going to pop that out just so I can reroute this front panel audio cable. I thought I was going to have that go across the top of the CPU cable, but I've actually changed my mind on that. These front panel cables are quite difficult to get into a nice location and remain tidy around the back. Um, as I say, having very little options along the front, uh, the, the PSU shroud has very few options for cable routing, which I'm not an enormous fan of, but you know, I can work with this. So we need our reset switch down there. We need our power switch in there and then our power LED the positive goes on my left towards the back of the case and the negative goes on my right toward the front of the case there we go now those guys are in we'll just Bring the USB 3 front header around. I think I can just get that guy in there. This is a bit of an exact turn, but I think I can make it work. I can't wait for USB Type C to replace this guy. There we go. Right, and that's in place, and we've still got a bit of room there to get our PCI Express wires through. Uh... I've still got to get all my fan wires down there as well. Man, the lack of holes between the bottom of the motherboard and the power supply enclosure, really hard to work with here and keep everything nice and tidy. I've got those in, but I've also got to run my fans down there as well. I mean, that's unusual. Normally you don't plug all your fans in along the bottom of the motherboard, but just, yeah, that's still a thing that has to be done. Okay, well, to solve my problems, I really need to get my PCI Express cables into position now so I can just carry on stuffing cables in there without worrying too much. So let's get the PCI Express cables into place. So I need to push these down to the bottom of this enclosure so the excess gets pushed down there and they can feed up into the main enclosure of the case. So I'm going to try and get these lined up so they move together as one. I can still uh, take the screws out from the hard drive enclosure to give myself a little bit more leeway. I'm just trying to avoid having to do that at the moment. And just as a pro tip, as you can see, I've got the front panel off the case at the moment, so I can put my hand in and through the front panel to get into the main enclosure and pull cables through. It makes this part very much easier. Okay, that's one. And that's two. I'm just going to have a look and see how those are sitting. Now, just due to the way the cables have run, they've both come up. One of them is this way up and one of them is that way up. And this guy's correct. This guy needs to rotate through 180 degrees. So this guy's going to be fine. We'll zip tie that together and that's just going to feed in like that to the graphics card and that'll look fine. However, this guy, we've got to put a twist in this and I don't, I want to do that in the power supply enclosure where you can't see it, not up here where we'll have just an ugly twist in the wire. Um, if we're going to use these ribbons, I want them to be flat when they're in, when they're in sight. 
So let's see if we can resolve that. Ah, there we go. I think that's done the job. I think that'll be all right. Okay, we've actually managed to pull out the reset switch somehow. So I'll plug that back in. Right, now I've just got to figure out how I'm going to get my system fans down to here. And at this point, it seems fairly prudent to me that we're going to front mount our radiator. So we're going to have the, um, the Corsair H100i radiator mounted up the front here. Um, and that means I'm going to put the, um, I'm going to put the Corsair, I'm going to put the H100's fans on the radiator at the front. And these fans, we're going to relocate to the top as exhaust fans. So these are going to come off. We're going to put them up here. The H100's fans will be powered from the H100 itself. So that will be resolved. And if I move these up to here, I can have the three, I can have the three case fan wires going down the back of the system and come up through here and just go into those headers there, which means I don't have to get anything else through this already overcrowded grommet. So that works just fine. As I say, this single hole to put everything through, I don't like that at all. It's doable, um, but yeah, it's it's not ideal if you've got a congested system like this. I know there's other places we could run these cables, but ideally in a well-designed case, you shouldn't have to choose. You should just be able to run these cables wherever you want because different things work for different builds. There are some builds where you want to have it through here. There are some where you want it to have it through there. It just depends on how your motherboard is laid out. Oof. Yeah, good luck top mounting your radiator on this. Um, yeah, uh, if you've got tall RAM, that's not going to happen. And if you've got a 280mm rad because of the VRM heat sinks, that's not going to happen. Uh, yeah, front mount in this guy. To be honest, this is a this case is sensible for front mounting anyway. That's why you have the extra front room. Right, so these fan cables are going to destroy my cable routing meta here because they're only just about going to reach, I fear. I'm not super het up about having really tidy fan wires because the fans are probably the first thing that will get changed on this computer in the future. You'll notice that I've sort of been giving a slight emphasis on RGB on components, yet we've kind of got these just bog standard black um, three pin fans in. It's fully my intention that these will get changed at some point in the computer's lifetime. Um, however, I didn't want to put in fancy fans because it's going to slap another £100 onto the, well, £100 and change uh, onto the price tag because you'd want to put Corsair fans in this thing because it's a Corsair and MSI build. Um, you know, putting in any other brand fans would just be such a pity. But Corsair fans, yeah, it's going to net you 120 quid to put in the nice ones and a controller. Oh, they will reach, we're fine, good. Um, all right, now I wanna make sure that they're all lined up correctly. Okay, fans have been repositioned re and reconnected. That's not too bad, actually. They're kind of just doing diagonals, just going across there. I don't like cables that do this. I like to be able to go across or down here or, you know, down in a loom like this because that's going to tuck out the way. You know, I like to do something along those lines, but it's okay. So that's fine. Um, all our power cables are in place. That's okay. I think we can put in our hard drive trays now just to store those. I'm actually going to screw this hard drive cage in now because I think all the hard stuff is now done. Right, so now I can put in the SSD, which we kind of wanted to do ages ago. But now that can go in there and I can put our natty little SSD heatsink on top of it. 
And yeah, all those screws line up. So that guy's gonna go into the motherboard screw. That guy goes into the end screw. Right, now it is time to get our CPU cooler in place. So um, I'm gonna move all this to one side for a sec because we've got to kind of build up the CPU cooler a bit. We've got to get the fans mounted to it. Actually, or do we? No, we don't because we're gonna bolt everything through. So let's just, oh, I do need to make sure I've got the correct fittings on it though. So at present, we've got the Intel bracket mounted to this guy. So we've got to take off the Intel bracket and put on the AMD one. So what are our choices here? Uh, I'm going to grab the instruction packet because I haven't fitted one of these ones with these kinds of fittings. Now I want to make sure I've got the right ones. Yada yada yada. Ah, oh, I see. Okay, that's fine. So they're using the two-point hold-down mechanism. So we're going to be using these plastic lugs that are pre-installed on the motherboard. Uh, I got confused because I'd spotted these brackets in there, which are these boys. And I thought this one, I was like, oh, that looks like one half of an AM4 bracket, right? But no, these two go together and that's your Threadripper mounting bracket. So that's what those are all about. So do these things just pull off? Yeah, yeah, sure, why not? That's okay, actually. The idea of not bolting on these um, brackets seems a bit odd to me, but those click in with a very satisfying click. Yeah, nice. Okay. Okay, right. That guy is going to go in there. And we're going to mount that in like that. So I'm going to grab the brackets and I'm going to bolt this guy down first, just so this guy isn't just sitting around in the case rattling around and then we'll bolt the um, uh, the radiator up into the front. So I need one of these hooks and a thumb screw. I'm not a big fan of this mounting mechanism but it does the job. It's not my first choice. I would have preferred Corsair to have sorted out a method that uses the four motherboard holes and a proper back well uh, that uses the back plate rather than just this two point hold down. It's functional, it's just not my favorite. I guess it's easier to fit, but I, ha I had a lot more confidence in the old style ones where you had four thumb screws and you actually screwed it down properly. But uh, this works. There we go, and that guy's on. And I'll just screw those down. And we're going monkey tight, not gorilla tight. So I'm just turning them until the screws stop. That'll do. That's in position. It is a tidy looking install, I'll give it that. Considering, um, as far as I'm concerned, one of the points of having water cooling is to move the bulk of the cooling somewhere else. Um, because obviously the issue with big air, air coolers is that's just an enormous tower air cooler that just takes up all of this space in your computer. Whereas the nice thing about these AIOs is you're moving all of the metal work, a la the radiator, somewhere else. I'm just going to take this turn out of it. Huh. Well, that, ah. that actually kind of wants to naturally twist that way. That's fine. That's going to go in like that. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, let's unpack the fans. These are Corsair's proper big static pressure fans. These are good four pin fans, these. These aren't um, LED or anything like that. However, performance wise, they will deliver. So these guys go on the radiator. These other fans, we don't need them to be particularly high performance. They're just airflow fans. And also, I've got the front... Oh, go away, good grief. Adamant IT. Now I need these long fan screws. I'm just going to pull out four of them for a sec. Two per fan. I'll put the rest in in a minute, but I just want to get everything mounted up first. 
So these guys are going to go all the way through the fan and into the radiator. So we go through the case, through the fan, into the radiator, and we sandwich the whole lot together with a single set of screws. Right, our locating screws are in place. So I'm just gonna shuffle this around. Now, because we've got these curves on the front, I'm just gonna align it just so the fans align with those curves nicely, and then it'll look the nicest. As usual, monkey tight, not gorilla tight. Good, that's fine. I'm gonna grab another four screws and we'll put in the other four screws now. There we go. And I've got some new cables now that need to be routed through the back. So I'm going to take the computer upright and just sort those out. Right, this little guy here that's sticking out, that's just a little taco meter. That is going to run back to the uh, CPU fan header. So I'll just run that back and get him plugged in. And that provides a speed signal to the um, motherboard to tell it that there is actually a cooling fan of sorts connected for the CPU. You may have noticed we now have a SATA power connector to contend with and it's right in the middle of the case. So that sucks. It's a good thing I put in this SATA power chain. I genuinely forgot that we were going to need this. So yeah, really glad I didn't forget this now. I mean, it wouldn't be too difficult to plug one in because the that, that end of the power supply is actually quite accessible at the moment, but whatever. I'll still pat myself on the back. <laughs> right, that's going to go like that. Plug him in there. I'm going to run that under the ATX cable there. And I can just put a little zip tie in here just to hold that in place, I think. There we go. And we still have spare SATA for a hard drive if we need to. Now our fans. I'm going to bring these up and I'm going to fold those up. There we go. This guy's trying to be clever and sticking up, but that's fine. When we put the side panel on, that'll just lay flat in the case. So there we go. So we've got a couple of straight cables around the back here, but that's okay. Everything is logical. There's not a huge amount going on in the back of the case on this computer, which is nice. Um, and that just means that it will be fairly easy to maintain this machine later on. So uh, that's all good. I think we're done back here. I'm gonna... No, I'm not gonna put the back side panel on quite yet. We don't need to. However, we are ready for the centerpiece that is our graphics card. So let's take out a couple of PCI blanking plates. PCI Express slot unlocked. Bang. Good grief, this thing is a bear moth. I could have had my PCI Express cables come out from the side there. I might still reroute those, we'll find out in a moment. Let's get some screws into that bad boy to hold him in place. Oh yeah, hypothetically, so what's the deal with this guy? Hmm. Is this for if you're water cooling it? Can anyone tell me what this guy's for? It's clearly a support bracket of some kind, but it doesn't fit in this configuration. Is that for when you're water cooling it to prevent sag because you're not using the back plate or something like that? This graphics card has earned the privilege of, being, of having two screws to hold it in. 
I usually only put my graphics cards in with one screw because normally it's not like they're going to fall out. However, this one is a big boy. I will give him two screws. And uh, yeah, after all of that, I want to reroute these cables. After all of my faff getting everything out of that single grommet, I want them to come out there so they can do that. Because otherwise they've kind of got to go across. Not a fan of that. Ugh, let's sort it all out. To be honest, I'm not really that sad about it. I think it's actually going to feel a lot better having that like that. And now we'll route these into the top and I'm giving them enough slack just so we'll have a nice... Hey, why aren't you going in? There we go. Oh. And I'm going to route these as such that we have a nice smooth loop coming out here. But I need to make sure that loop, uh, that loop will just slightly smush against the glass, but that's okay. There we go. Right, now I'm going to put the back cover on because I want all of these cables to just stay where they are now. I'm just length matching these power cables just so they look nice. The glass is going to sit on those ever so slightly and they'll just sit in like that and that'll look fine. Again, these things are begging to have some... Um, uh, some individually braided lines going into it, but again, just braided extensions, more money. But that's something that can always be installed at a later date. There we go. All the fans are clear. Got another peel there. Mmm. That's it. It's ready. Damn it! It lifted! I'm using a Mr. Sheen multi-surface polish on the glass here. I did it, um, I put the glass in back uh, upside down so I could polish the back of it. Now I've done the peel and I'm going to polish the front of it. And this multi-surface polish, it will make the glass lovely and smooth and clear and it will help it reject fingerprints which is always nice and because this is tempered glass we can literally just go at this with a nice uh, soft cloth and not worry about scratching it at all and we'll get a beautiful crystal clear window to see inside the computer and for the ground switch on please try turning on the power supply first Lovely. You know, despite the fact that we couldn't get the RGB fans in there, that smattering of RGB, I love it already. It's in exactly the right places. Good. Uh, everything is recognized. Got enough everything. V-Core is at 1.47. Hmm. Good. Okay, that's great. So. This thing starts and runs. Um, I'm going to finish up doing all of my B-roll footage for the sake of the build video and stuff like that. And then I'm going to come back around and I'm going to start configuring, installing windows and so on and so forth. So uh, I've got my post, which means that it works. I'm going to turn it off for now and I'll do all of my, um, I'll do all of my pretty looking shots and then we'll come back and we'll set this thing up properly. Now back to the editing desk. 
Unfortunately, at this point, time and too many interruptions caught up with me, and I did not have time to sit down and go through the setup of this machine. There wasn't a huge amount to it, but I've been wanting to quickly show the BIOS setup for a build at some point, because there are a couple of things that you want to make sure you get sorted on a new build. Um, the long and the short of it is, and I'll demonstrate this in another video at some point, but we make sure that a, XMP is switched on, so our 3600 memory is actually running at 3600. And because this is a uh, AMD Ryzen with high-speed memory, we also want to make sure that our Infinity Fabric clock, so the FCLK clock, is running at half the maximum memory speed. So technically it's a one-to-one -one ratio because 3600 memory is actually 1800 doubled um, because it's double data rate. So our F clock should be running at 1800, which would put it at a one-to-one -one ratio with the memory. And then finally, the other thing I did was I locked off um, vCore at 1.25 volts, which is probably still a little bit higher than it need to be. We probably could have gone lower than that. However, that 1.47 we had at auto, that's way too high. And that just means this the chip is going to run unnecessarily hot, which might mean that it's not quite boosting as hard as it could. So we um, just dropped the voltage down and locked that off at 1.25. And that just gave us a nice safe value that's not going to go too low, but it'll, at the same time is way lower than what the auto uh, voltage was trying to run it at. So that's it. Thank you very much for tuning in, everyone. And I will see you in the next video. Bye for now.